All right, friends, it's so good to have you here today. Diane, I'm so glad to have you join us for this service. I want to point these out again. These tags are in our welcome center, which is also a prayer center for us. There are ample tags downstairs, and there are two hopes for that space, and that is that any of you who have someone who needs prayer, or if you need prayer yourselves, will fill out one of these and hang it on the prayer wall. And if you haven't had a chance to see it, I'm gonna be here for a little bit after service if you wanna go down and see the welcome center. It's the room next door to the office. And the prayer is that we will use these and share our prayer concerns with each other in that way, but that we will also invite people from outside our immediate household to join us in sharing their prayers. But the second piece of it is the, is the hope that we will maybe come in a little early sometime and sit down there and pray. Take some time to look at some of the concerns that are lifted on the board and turn on the light with, within the beautiful cross that uh, the McLean family put down there. And just take some quiet time to pray on your own or a couple of you together. It's a room that is meant to be used. So I hope that you will take an opportunity to do that. For our announcements today, I want to lift up a couple of things. I will be away visiting my family in Charlotte starting tomorrow for 10 days. Jude Urso is going to provide pastoral care. He's the pastor at the Elizabeth United Methodist Church. And I'll make sure you have the information that you need for that for, um, in an email before I leave. And Pastor Sandra will be leading worship next week. And that gives her an opportunity to be the celebrant for communion as well, which as a retired person, you don't often get and I'm very grateful for her for doing that. We're holding the date of October 15th open, right Patty? For a fellowship evening event in our Thelma Harrison courtyard. And we're gonna hope and pray that the weather will hold out for us. You're hoping for good weather that weekend as you go to a family wedding. And then afterward, we'll be making the dough for our apple dumplings, which we have decided to do an apple dumpling sale this fall, done very carefully with um, with some good measures being taken to provide the safety of those who will be doing the baking. So there's a sheet at the, uh, in the um, narthex for orders for apple dumplings. And we're not trying to trick you to come to the fellowship event to have you here to make the dough. But if you see how much fun is being had, you might want to stay anyway. So there's a little more about that. The traditional bulletin is in the back if you would like to take one of those. Any other announcements for the good of the body? I can't think of anything else right off. All right. Then let us call ourselves to God's worship. We feel gratitude when we come to our household of faith and to this sanctuary. We feel gratitude for God's presence in our world. We feel that God's presence brings us hope and the gift of life. They are gifts that humble us. We are humbled by God's invitation to begin anew so many ways in all that we do and in all that we are. And we know that we are blessed in this place to be surrounded by people who believe. People who believe in God, people who believe in Christ and in the Holy Spirit. When we come together to worship, we are in God's presence, full of gratitude, humbled and glad. Let us worship God. Oh 
always take a time to honor the act of offering. I know it's different for us. It's a little bit hard to get used to, even after all these months, not to have the plates passed and, and ha have those clear signals of what we're doing during this time. But our plate is in the back, our offering plate, and we know that during this time, we think of our gratitude toward God of the many ways in which God has filled our life. So, BJ, I believe our hymn is It Is Well. That's correct. Number 377 in our United Methodist hymnal. So, if you would turn to that, we can, as we sing, consider what it is that you will offer to God in this week. prayers for traveling mercy says I travel to Charlotte. I also want to give all of you an update on Skeeter Grant. Skeeter has had a difficult week. It has not been easy. We continue to pray for healing in accordance with God's will. So please keep Skeeter in your prayers, Harriet Grant's son. I also want to say once again that Harriet and her family are incredibly faithful and they are keeping vigil with Skeeter. Harriet is there 
often 10 hours a day. So I would like to ask prayer for them, that they will be strengthened and empowered by God's love in their vigil. And a special, a special prayer for our very dear Harriet. What are your prayer concerns today? Patty? I have one. <laughs> um, my grandson Austin was diagnosed with COVID this week. Your grandson? And the great-grandson has another virus. But he's negative for COVID, thank God. And my friend Corrine was just rushed to the hospital last night. And I don't know what the problem is. But Corey? Corey. C O R E Y? No. C O R I N E. Okay. Corrine, perhaps. Corrine. Okay. And Calvin, cousin Glenn, <coughs> is back in the hospital with pneumonia again. The one we've been praying for. Okay. So we have your grandson who has been diagnosed with COVID. Your great grandson has another virus. Thank God it's not COVID. And Corin, who's been Corrine. rushed. Corinne. Corinne, who's been rushed to the hospital. And Calvin's cousin is back in the hospital. We repeat them all out of respect to those of us who will join on YouTube so that they can be clearly heard. Anyone else for prayer today? All right, then I'm going to offer prayer for BJ. BJ is so faithful in worship that wouldn't, you wouldn't know he's not feeling well today, but I'm going to tell you because BJ needs our prayers as well. All right. I feel better now that you gave me a cupcake. <laughs> Baked goods, the great healer. Absolutely. All right, our prayer hymn is Let There Be Peace on Earth, number 431.
Lord, we come before you in prayer, praying that you will listen. And yet the truth is that you listen to us always. We come to you in prayer beseeching, begging, imploring, asking. And you listen. You always listen. You have given us this wondrous doorway called prayer. Not so that you might be present with us, but that we might be present with you. For in prayer we seek you, Lord. In prayer we call upon your name. In prayer we bow before your mercy seat. Perhaps we are the ones who need to listen. For Lord, you always listen. You hear us as we lift up those of our own household of faith who are sick and who need you. You know their needs better than they know them themselves, and yet you give us the privilege of bearing them before you in prayer. You know that there are several people in our congregation at this time within this household who are seeing aging parents through difficult times. You know far better than I can express the mix of joy and sorrow, of pain and healing and lifting and even being down that those circumstances can bring. You reside in each room of each loved one who we lift up week after week after week for we dare not fail in prayer. You hear us as we lift up needs of those closest to us and as our prayers ripple out to the world beyond, far, far to people we will never know, but who we know need you as well. For you, Lord, always listen. We thank you for that doorway that you have given us, that doorway of prayer that helps us to be present to you. And as we ask and beseech and implore, sometimes even beg, help us to be the one at times who simply stop to listen. Listen for your voice that we hear in myriad ways. Listen for your word Seek to discern your plan. Lord our God, we thank you for the doorway that you give us in prayer. A doorway that brings us into your presence. You who are constantly present with us. All of this we lift up in the name of the one who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I will be using the scripture passage in the context of the sermon because this passage that I'm using today needs to be told only after you know the story that precedes it. It is the story of the whole book of Esther. You know, when I was in seminary, there were very few classes, especially prepared for women in ministry. And my Old Testament professor, Dr. H. Neil Richardson, United Methodist pastor, created the class on the books of Ruth and Esther so that we could finally say that there had been a class prepared, especially with the growing number of women in mind at seminary. And of course it was for everybody. 
I love the story of Esther. Now, I'm going to ask you to keep your kazoo handy. And for those of you who have your mask on, this is exciting because you're going to get to lift it a little bit. Liberation. Liberation in sight. You blow on the big end. I had a couple of those guys that you know very well in the first servers who were trying to toot away over here. So on the big end, how do you blow a kazoo? How do you play a kazoo? Hum. You hum. I had to be reminded of that myself. So... <laughs> So I practiced. But our hum is going to be strident and brash because I'm going to invite you as I tell the story of Esther. Every time I say the name Haman, I want you to go, wait. When I was in seminary with Dr. Richardson as a professor, I lived in the home of an Orthodox Jewish family named the Torskis. I had two rooms off to the side. And as I was getting ready for bed one night around 9 o'clock, this very quiet family all of a sudden started to holler and play noisemakers and be incredibly loud. And I had no idea what was going on. It wasn't until the next day when I went into class and I mentioned this that someone said, well, our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrated the festival of Purim yesterday. During the festival of Purim, there is a reading of the Megillah. The Megillah is the entire book of Esther. Haman is the villain of the piece. Now, I think King Ahasuerus deserves a great deal of the blame as well, although he redeems himself in the end. But Haman is the villain of the piece. So during the reading of the Megillah in a Jewish household on the celebration of Purim, everyone rattles a noisemaker every time Haman's name is mentioned to drown out the name of this evil man. So as I tell you the story today, I'm going to give you fair warning because we haven't been doing this our entire lives. My Jewish daughter-in-law knows when Haman is coming up in the story, so she's prepared. I'll give you a heads up. Everybody, I want you to practice. Let's hear those kazoos. <laughs> Love it. The story of Esther takes place in the 5th century BCE. The king at the time was named Ahasuerus. Now, I managed to say Ahasuerus several times in the early service, but couldn't get citadel out for love or money. So we'll see if I do better in this service. I want to begin by reading you some passages from the first chapter of the book of Esther, because it describes the magnificence and the power of the kingdom about which we speak. This happened in the days of Ahasuerus, the same Ahasuerus who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present while he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. Now that's a party. When these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in the, city of, in the citadel of Susa, both great and small, a banquet lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now listen, listen to the richness of this description. There were white cotton curtains and blue hangings tied with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and colored stones. Drinks were served in golden goblets, goblets of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Drinking was by flagons without restraint, for the king had given orders to all the officials of his palace to do as each one decided. Furthermore, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the palace of King Ahasuerus. 
That just shows the magnitude, the magnificence of, ha of Ahasuerus' reign. During this banquet, one evening, the king called for Queen Vashti to come before his advisors. He wanted to show off his queen. Vashti refused. She was not going to allow herself to be paraded in front of this group of men who had been partying for quite some time, as they so desired. And so the king's advisor said to King Ahasuerus, you've got to do something about the queen. She's going to cause all of the wives to think they can disobey their husbands. Now, ladies, if you want to blow your kazoo for a new understanding of time, feel free. That was not Vashti's reality. For all intents and purposes, Ahasuerus divorced her and sent her to live apart from all that he had. And so he needed a new queen. So the king's advisors sent out word that they were going to gather up all the most beautiful virgins of his kingdom. And so that is what they did. One of the women who came to live at the palace was Esther. Esther was the niece of a man named Mordecai. She had been orphaned, and Mordecai chose to raise her as his own. Mordecai warned Esther not to reveal her ethnic heritage because it would not be seen in a good light within the palace. And so she kept her heritage a secret. For 12 months, these young women were put through, and I find this kind of funny in the scriptural reading, cosmetic treatments. I just didn't expect to see that, and it hit me differently this time. So they went through 12 months of cosmetic treatment, six months with some kind of oil, six months with something else. And at the end of this time, as with each month, Esther became more and more the favorite of the king, he chose to make her his queen. Now Mordecai, her uncle, would sit at the king's gates every day to watch over Esther and see how she was doing. And one day he became aware of a plot to assassinate the king. And so he got the message through to the palace that this assassination plot was taking place with the names of those who had thought it up. And the king was able, in hearing this through Esther's voice, to stop the plot and assassinate the assassins. Esther told him that the news came to her through a man named Mordechai. And this will, this will be very important as the story goes on. Now you can get ready, BJ. It was at this time that Ahasuerus promoted Haman. <laughs> and he set him above all his officials. And the king decreed, decreed that all people who passed by the gate would bow before Haman. <laughs> but Mordecai refused because he worshipped only the God of the Israelites. Haman <laughs> was infuriated with Mordecai's behavior. And in learning that he was of the Jewish people, he began to plot for the destruction of all Jews living in the king's kingdom. Haman <laughs> cast lots to determine the date for the annihilation. And he told the king these words, there is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people and they do not keep the king's law so that it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business so that they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea to me, which is why I said he's kind of a bad guy in the piece as well. And so decrees were sent out to every corner of the kingdom. The word poor, P-U-R, is the Hebrew word for the lots, such as the lots that Haman <laughs> cast to determine the date for this slaughter. 
Mordechai learned of what was going on as the decrees went out throughout the kingdom and he wore sackcloth and ashes and stayed at the gate. And when Esther learned that he was out there in sackcloth and ashes, she sent him out fine clothes, but he refused to wear them. She asked, well, ordered, she was the queen, Hattach, one of the king's eunuchs, to go out and find out from Mordecai what was going on. She had not heard this. And so he told her about the decrees that Haman, oh, you're getting the hang of it. You're getting so ready for this. I don't even have to give you a heads up. Told her, uh, she learned about these edicts and these decrees. And in the message that came back through Hatach, he asked Esther to intervene with the king on their behalf to save her people. Now Esther knew that to go before the king without being commanded to come would be certain death. You could only go before the king, anybody, including his favorite queen, if you were invited. And she had not been called by him for quite some time. But she took the risk. She decided that this was something she must do. And she went and she stood in a corner of the court and the king saw her and called her forward. And he would always say to her, what would you ask of me, Queen Esther? Anything that I have is yours up to half of my kingdom. And so she said, I've just come here today, my king, to invite you and Haman <laughs> to a banquet. Well, on his way home that day, Haman again. Oh yeah, oh sorry. <laughs> I'm so glad you're on top of this. He again went before Mordecai, and Mordecai again refused to bow down before him. So Haman was even more incensed. I gotta get my act together here. Yeah, don't count on it. <laughs> This is the more informal service, so I can formally mess up. I like it. He went home and he told his family, I'm so excited because tomorrow I have been invited by Queen Vashti to a banquet alone with the king, just the two of us. But it's really upsetting me that the Jew Mordechai is still sitting at the king's gate and he will not bow down to me. So then Haman's... <laughs> Wife, Zeresh, and all his friends said to him, and I quote, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordechai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the banquet in good spirits. This advice pleased Haman, <coughs> and he had the gallows made. Well, that night the king couldn't sleep, and he chose to do something that I never do. When I can't sleep, I usually pick a book that I really enjoy reading. He asked his advisors to bring him the court records. That had to be a snoozer, don't you think? And yet he stayed awake through the reading, and as they were reading, he was reminded of a plot on his life about which he had been warned by a man named Mordechai. And he said to them, what has been done for this man, for what he did to save my life? And they said, uh, nothing. And the king said, well, that will not do. So he started talking to Haman <laughs> and asked, what should the king do to honor a man? Now, who do you think Haman <laughs> thought the king was talking about? Well, obviously, he thought so much of himself that he thought, who else would the king want to honor but me, Haman? <laughs> Drown that name out. And so he said, For the man whom the king wishes to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden with a royal crown on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let him robe the man whom the king wishes to honor, and let him conduct the man on horseback through the open square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. And then Haman <laughs> found out the king was talking about 
Mordechai. And who do you think would be the high official who had to robe Mordecai? So Haman <laughs> put the robes and the horse and robed Mordecai and led him riding through the open square of the city, proclaiming, thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Well, after this, the king and Haman <laughs> went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day of this banquet, the king asked Esther, what would you like, Esther? Whatever you ask, it shall be granted to you. Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. And then Esther answered, if I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold 10,000 talents of silver, I and my people to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have had my, held my peace, but no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Is he who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. <laughs> then Haman <laughs> was terrified before the king and the queen. The king rose from the feast in wrath and went into the palace garden, but Haman. <laughs> stayed to beg his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that the king had determined to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman <laughs> had thrown himself on the couch where Esther was reclining. This is part of our scripture reading listed in the bulletin for today. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the words left the king of the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, look, the very gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, stands at Haman's house. Fifty cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated. I'm going to leave the last three chapters exactly where they are in the Bible because they're a bit gruesome. If you want to read them on your own, feel free. But they are rather violent. This is the story that every year during the month of Adar, which is around late winter, early spring, our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate as Purim. Do you see where the word Purim comes from? Poor, the lots that that guy, I'm going to give you a break here, that that guy cast to find the date for this annihilation turned into the word Purim for a festival, a celebration, a joyous time that marks for our Jewish brothers and sisters the day when Queen Esther saved them all for they truly would have been annihilated. On the celebration of Purim, Jews wear costumes. My lovely little granddaughter always dresses up for Purim just as if it's Halloween. And noisemakers are rattled, the Megillah is red, but more than that, money gifts must be given to at least two poor people. Gifts of two kinds of food have to be sent to at least one person. And a joyous, high celebration with a feast must be held. Remembering our stories is important. They remind us of where we have been, and they direct us to where they, we are going. They guide us in our present, in the very place in which we live out our stories. Over the past year and way too many months, we have been living out a story. 
And there is a word in our society today that we can barely stand to hear anymore, much less say. And yet it is so clearly still a part of us that we're not going to be rid of it for a while. So I'm going to ask us for the remainder of this sermon to drown out that word, COVID. Last December, late December 2019, we first heard of COVID. In March of 2020, our lives changed because of COVID. On March 11, it was declared a pandemic. And on March 15th, I clearly remember, as I was guest pastor that day, announcing that we would not be worshiping in person for months. On March 23rd, we received shutdown orders from the governor. Our lives changed because of COVID. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing from the first service. You did great on the Heyman parts, but the minute I mentioned COVID, man, you're honking on those kazoos. We have worn our own versions of sackcloth and ashes, masked, gloved, sanitized. We learned to shop differently, live differently, all because of COVID. <laughs> we have learned of family and friends passing away. You know, I remember in the early months of COVID, we would talk about people far away. We would talk about statistics and numbers. And I remember distinctly in a Zoom worship service when that changed for our household. Because COVID <laughs> became personal with the death of a best friend's son. And over the past few months, and even more so in the last month or two, it has become more and more personal. There came that time when we started worshiping in person again, only to have COVID <laughs> increase. We spent Thanksgiving, Advent, Christmas, Worshipping at home, vaccinations became available, but on Easter we returned. And yet now we are masked again. But in the midst of all, in the midst of all, COVID <laughs> has not kept us from worshipping. Hear that well. It has not kept us from worshipping. It has not kept us from praying. It has not kept us from reaching out to others, from planning and preparing for a new day, from being God's people. Sometimes I heard the phrase, we can't be the church during COVID. <laughs> God help us if that came from our lips during this time. Because we can be the church in the midst of anything and everything that the world dishes out to us. And I believe that we have learned that in this place, in this household. We are God's people no matter what. God gives us a peace, as we've been singing about today, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of troubling times. God gives us reasons to feel joy, even in the midst of what we have been living through. COVID <laughs> can't place our faith on the gallows or threaten our belief in God's presence with us or keep us from being God's people in this time. Our stories are important. How we remember them defines us. How we tell them becomes our legacy. What will we tell our future generations? What are we teaching them today in learning how they are to speak of this time? If we simply tell what COVID <laughs> took away, that will define us. If we live a story of a people who persevered, who cared for one another, who protected one another, who came together, we will be defined by the strength of our faith. That is what our Jewish brothers and sisters do every Purim. They define themselves by the strength of their faith because in the mysterious behind scenes of what was going on in the court of King Ahasuerus, God was at work. 
unbeknownst to the officials of that court, God was at work. That God who was the only one to whom Mordechai would bow down. And if we tell our stories right, our children for generations to come will know that even in the midst of all this, God is at work and that we are a people of God. What story will you tell? Will we, because of how we comport ourselves now, be able to drown out the word COVID in the telling? Amen. All right, now you were so good at that that I almost feel like I have to take those away from you. I'm really afraid one of you is going to be in the grocery store this afternoon and somebody's going to say that word and you're all going to go nuts. <laughs> and if you do, please get video. I'd like to see it. BJ, I've got Peace Like a River, 2145 in the Faith We Sing. In offering the blessing as we leave worship today, I am using an old Sarum liturgy from England, a benediction that has survived since the 13th century. God be in your head and in your understanding. God be in your eyes and in your looking. God be in your mouth and in your speaking. God be in your heart and in your thinking. God be at your end and at your departing. May the blessing of God be upon you. Amen. Amen.